you know, I, I had always loved stories as a kid. I'd always read a, a, an awful lot. There was an, an awful lot of books in our house. And uh, so I knew, I kind of, I, I, I loved story and I loved, uh, I loved being someone else. Like I loved not having my own shit. Like, you know, I just love like, not being somebody else. I mean, I'm a huge advocate of theatre. I think it's like the, the, the best way you can possibly learn. It's the most... Uh, terrifying thing to do in an exhilarating way is to go up in front of a live audience and just perform and bring that character to life and do it repeatedly over and over and do two shows a day you know I, 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 I am and the other thing I would say I suppose is just make if you can just make shit you know mm -hmm. like make 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 films and make make short films and get your friends together and do all of that I didn't have the technology to do that when I was younger but now you can do it on your phone you yeah. know so like I really advocate Young young actors to go and directors to go and just make 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 stuff, doing theater, touring around, then doing little bits, and then going right. On, you know, I, I I can work, so I can learn, and then just re reading plays. And I read a lot of like actors' biographies. You know, the journey yeah. of how you became an actor and how you persevered, and just just kept getting up after getting like rejected and getting up again and. And then also choices and like we've all taken the wrong job and <laughs> you know then you know and, and but that, that's okay yeah you can still have a you can still keep your taste and your um values intact even if you take the wrong job mm -hmm. for a minute it's okay so all of that i'm, I'm very curious about that a lot of directors mm -hmm. books on directing and stuff like that but in terms of the confidence i don't know it I, you know, I still, it's a work in progress, to be honest with you. I watched a lot of films as well during those those periods of unemployment and sitting around <laughs> watching other actors and watching all the great movies. And um, again, I think that's a great that's a great uh, education. Um, and then I did little, like small parts in, in short films, quite a few. And the, it was in film and telly. It was really, really gradual, like a little part here and there, a little part here and there, a slightly bigger part here. You know, it was. There was nothing uh, immediate, uh, and I think I would have found that quite terrifying if you were landed a huge role in a huge movie at 22 or something. I I, I don't think I could have survived that, or or, or I think I wouldn't. Uh, I needed to. It needed to be kind of uh, pay my apprenticeship. You know what I mean? And how were you at auditioning during this this time? Yeah, I was terrible. Um, I was terrible. I was not. I was not bad at the kind of chat. You know, they're like, "How are you? Nice, nice to see you." And they're like, <laughs> I, um, That's but, acting. But I was terrible at the scenes because I always felt like you do realize this this isn't what I would do. I mean, this is just a vague, rudimentary sketch of what I would like to do and feels so uh, it's so reductive a process, you do you know? And I know there's no other way to do it. Um but uh but all you need is one person to yeah. click with that gets it. Like, persevere, write letters. Yeah. People really appreciate getting a letter, uh, you know, yeah. handwritten to someone and to say how much I love your work, I would love to work with you. Uh, you know, actors' careers are so haphazard and not by design. No, anyone who says, oh, you have a career plan is lying. <laughs> like, you don't, you, you, you're just trying to figure it out day by day. And, and you never know what the universe is going to throw at you. You never know what the industry is going to spit out next. So, you just try and find the, the good work in that. So I have no dream thing. The dream is to just kind of keep working. Mm -hmm. To me, it's the story and the medium is secondary, really. That's always the way it's been. I like I just follow the story. I'll do telly and I'll do theater if I think the story is better or, or at the time, this is the best story that presents itself. I can't learn lines off a screen. I have to have a, I have to have a, a real script. Um, I never learn my lines with anybody else can't do it it's a totally private can't yeah. use anything digital no i need to be in my own like uh, i love to just just be like spend as much time away on my own if possible prepping it's that immersive thing it starts with mm -hmm. the prep and it kind of begins to take over and see se se it seeps into everything really it's an important energy to to kind of crew like you need to have some of that energy when you go into a scene if you go into a scene knowing that you're wonderful and like knowing how to do it it's not going to be right because mm -hmm. nobody walks into a room knowing i'm going to know exactly yeah. what i'm going to do like everyone walks into a room trying to figure it out as human beings we don't know what we're going to how we're going to be so you're always just figuring it out as we go so like i think you if you know if you if you walk into a scene knowing how to do it you're fucking the thing scared. about it is like if you do anything 
for like 17 to 18 hours a day for a long time when you stop you're gonna have a lot of displaced energy yeah <laughs> that's just the na- but it becomes this whole romanticized thing about a man i'm still walking you're just yeah. not doing it <laughs> do you know what i mean well that's me anyway <laughs> you know uh, and i and i i feel like it's the it's the trying to like get back into real life because all, you've had all this energy and this focus and all of a sudden it's turned off so naturally you're and you're kind of in this in-between environment where you're you're not the character yeah but you're not yourself but you, you don't know what to do so it, that's what that's all that it is yeah, for yeah. me that's all that it is it's it's just a na- it's a, it's a very abrupt cessation of something that you've been deeply immersed in so then the, the come down will and the the the, the is difficult mm-hmm. well audition first of all getting an audition if you ever have done that it's hard to get an audition you know that's the first step hard to get an agent i the first agency i was with uh it was a small agency and i was friends with the secretary at the agency and we get the breakdowns which tells you you know what what casting directors are looking for and so i would find a part that i thought i was right for and i would call the um the producer or the studio or the network and pretend to be an agent at this agency and sell myself get myself a, a an audition you got to see this kid you know Clooney is a new kid he's in. and uh and and then they would call her they, they would call that agency and she would pick up the phone and take the uh, the auditions for me and i got several um callbacks i never got a job but i got a lot of callbacks and at least i got the audition you know uh that way and uh and and then eventually uh, i got with a, a better agency that was uh, that i was more right for and i got to go on auditions and you know i think what people don't understand who aren't in uh in, in this business is with the exception of Meryl Streep who i think got her first audition and i think won an oscar doing it most of us you know the first 100 auditions you don't get a job i mean you're just constantly going in and reading for something and you're not right for it or you or you are right for it and you're terrible i mean there's all of those things that have to happen along the way and and so you have to get really good at hearing no and trying to find something good in it you know it's a, it's it's a good lesson in humility along the way oftentimes we have this idea of uh, you know this fantasy could i have talked to myself when i was younger what wisdom would i impart it's, it sort of goes hand in glove with, with with becoming a parent you know and i'm constantly i think offering wisdom to my children they feel they're being lectured but uh, you know you you have this instinct to pass on those things you learn and most of those come from the places in which you feel like oh i if i could go back i would have done this better I don't think we're the best barometers of which things actually we should have changed in our past because there are truly things about my life which at times I uh, people said you know you'd be grateful this for one day and I just thought well you're an idiot like who in the world would be grateful this is you know and then truly I have come to a place where I found like real gratitude and thought you know I wouldn't have arrived at these other things had I not learned this in a, and learned it in a difficult and lasting way and so part of of i guess what i would say to myself at that age is just you know pay attention uh you know and i actually was i, I look back at them i thought god what a disaster you know, i was 24 years old who wants to see a video that says they were 24 like thank god i'm just at the generation where we don't carry the shackles of ourselves in high school on facebook and every you know thing we've ever posted but you know i probably would have said allow the ride to happen pay attention and and make sure and it's one of the things that i actually did do pretty much just learn from people smarter than you there's a certain arrogance in youth that you have to have because if you're not a little bit arrogant in the sense that you're totally obtuse to the idea that you're very almost certainly going to fail and that the whole thing's probably a disaster and you're probably going to end up accomplishing none of the things that you set out to you'd never be able to take the risk everybody i know who's accomplished stuff in in my business looks back and thinks like i had no idea i showed up here thinking i was going to have something to offer you know and i was nobody and there is a certain sort of denial that you have to cultivate and think well i know it's a disaster for everyone else but this is going to work for me if i follow through with it and then there is um a process that i was helped actually by when i refer to gratitude which is like you learn i've never met anybody i thought was really wise who i admired who i didn't see a real humility in 
And that humility allows you to gauge your own actions and behavior in a healthy way, whether they're business decisions or personal decisions, and hold them up to a metric, okay, I'm not sure this is a smart thing to do. I don't know best all the time. I'm capable of making mistakes. And that allows you then to be guided by people smarter than you, to learn from people who are better than you, to really take advice, the kind you can't take in youth. Because if you did, you, you know, you'd never leave the house. And so the growth into that place is filled with both a lot of triumphs that I never imagined and a lot of, uh, you know, really, you know, you, you lay yourself out there. And every time you do a project, people oftentimes think, oh, well, you were an alcoholic and you had to recover or you got divorced. Well, a lot of people deal with that stuff. It's actually not what defines you, right? We have personal difficulties and things we overcome. The thing that really defines you is ultimately, you know, who you want to be, which is in my case, principally a father. That's the most important thing in the world to me. Uh, and, and secondarily, like, what excites you and makes you feel alive? And, and can you connect that to your work life and do it with people you love? And the only way to do that is to take risks. So you have to combine that sort of willingness to take risks with wisdom to understand where the balance is when you maybe make a mistake. I became very popular and high and cool and I really thought, I must be very cool. People laugh at the things I say. I must be so much more charming, you know what I mean? People are interested in talking to me. And then I hit this tremendous cold headwind and learned what it was like to be very uncool very fast. So I was able to A, B, O, so all of this other relationships and all of this other dynamic were completely artificial and rooted in something that had nothing to do with me, but that had to do with what people thought, you know, what refracted glory they thought they were getting, what they could get through me or God knows what. But it was very instructional because at that point I learned, okay, none of these relationships are authentic or meaningful. They're transactional. They're people who want to advance what they want to do with the business. I can respect that. That's the way I can approach that. I'm not going to fix a lot of emotional or personal importance to those relationships. I'm not going to become unduly cynical. I had a child at the same time I thought, I'm going to live a life of which my daughter can be proud. The, the, the point being like, this is what matters to me and I have to approach that. And, and that was the central kind of lesson. I really got burned because it hurt my feelings so much because I subscribed to this. I thought, oh, I really, they really like me. I really am great. And it became important to me to get that attention and that reward. And also it was withheld a little bit. Well, he's popular, but he's not talented. Well, he's kind of insubstantial. He's a dilettante. Well, he's, you know, all of this stuff that we get as public figures that gets feedback to us. Some of it's negative now, it's more so. And then when I failed and I found people sort of celebrating that failure and rooting for that failure and go, this guy's talentless and vapid. And some of the stuff that was written about me like 2004, you know, it sort of still takes my breath away in, in, its, in its venality and cruelty. And I think you don't even know me, man. Like I, I wouldn't hate somebody who, who, who like, you know, broke into my house as much, but I did feel as though like, okay, and now I've lost everything. So I have to make it again in this business. But not only have to do that, I have to do it with the headwind of not just being anonymous, being uncool. Like, it's not that you haven't heard of him. You've heard of him, you just don't want it, which makes it very hard. So going back and being a director and proving myself, and that is what drove 10 years of my life. I'm gonna prove myself every fucking day to every person who didn't believe in me and I'm gonna work. I may not be, I, maybe I'm not talented. Maybe I'm stupid and worthless and meaningless, but I can work harder than anybody and I did that for a long time. And I, I did well. I found out, you know, I am talented. And what I learned was I don't need to have, I really learned the best lesson of my life, this capacity, which is not to use external approbation as the metric for whether or not you're worth something, whether or not you're good at it, but to actually genuinely develop your own criteria. Do, have I met my own expectations for myself? Have I done what I set out to do? Have I failed? Because the truth is, we all know the answer to that. Even when we succeed, I mean, that wasn't as good as I wanted it to be. Or we go, you know what, that, that was good. That We were trying to do something interesting. It didn't happen to work, but I'll, I would take that bet again at any time. And if you can internalize that, and it's just where I started to arrive to 15 years later, when, yeah, they didn't nominate me for director, and I wasn't surprised at all. I thought like, yeah. This is, I understood why, this is politics, popularity contest, there's all sorts of complications that go into this. But the truth is, I also got to a point where, and this is no disrespect to the Oscars or anything else, but it's not, those are subjective, external popularity contests voted on by groups of people, and that's not, I can't affix and hinge my happiness on like all of you guys loving me. I have to just do what I think is interesting and live to my own standards and integrity and be the kind of dad I need to be and husband I need to be. And then if people want to judge me and hate me, 
they're very likely going to do that. And so I, it released me from this desperate need to prove myself because I started to believe in myself. I'm not built for to be famous. I don't like it, you can keep it. I really have not gotten any benefit from it other than, you know, I've gotten out of some speeding tickets, and some restaurant reservations, and I don't wait in line at Disneyland, which may in fact be worth it if you've ever waited five hours to take a three minute ride. But other than that, I'm not somebody, and I have no judgment around this, a lot of performers kind of inherently, because nobody wants to play to an empty house, right? They want to have that attention. Part of it's a tree falling in the woods. If you are an artist, you want to have the audience experience your art, trying to generate empathy and move people well, if no one's there. So attention, people often conflate it with narcissism and solipsism and self-absorption. It's not really. What it is, is I'm somebody who wants to express something to people very profoundly to all people there to respond to that. And that is sort of becomes a part of fame. And now fame has segued into this sort of you know, desire to see behind the curtain, and we want to see behind the curtain, behind the curtain, behind the curtain. And the truth is behind the curtain is more boring and behind the curtain, behind the curtain is more boring. It takes a lot of work and energy and dedication of a lot of people to create this illusion for two hours of something really interesting and, and captivating. The real people are not that interesting. They're just really not. You know, um, they're just real people. And, and so celebrity itself, the, the attention in and of itself is not valuable to me personally at all. I'm shy, I don't want to tell people things. I've been criticized so often in my life and mischaracterized and misquoted and, and, and characterized in a way that makes me feel uncomfortable. And maybe sometimes it was fair and I just didn't want to accept it. And sometimes it wasn't fair. And the truth is, even when they write something good, I just think like, oh, I don't want to talk about this. You know, like I do not even love being here. You know, but this is a part of the, of the gig and I've, I've done it a lot because I don't seek the approbation, I don't get any satisfaction from that. All I can get is this sort of crummy feeling of like, well, I guess they all, that didn't go over that well. So what I'd like to be able to do is my job and not have to do that celebrity part. That's part of what I'm doing right. now. Well, I, you know, I worked here in New York City after college uh, in production. I was a location <coughs> scout, and that was how I made a, a decent living. Uh, but I had started working, uh, MTV Celebrity Deathmatch was the first acting job I ever had. So from that point, I always had a, a curiosity about it, like, well, I wonder what this would look like if it went further. And fast forward to the housing market collapsing mm. in 2008. I had booked a few other jobs. I started booking television and I thought, okay, well, this is an opportunity to see if I can actually make this work. So I moved to LA and for eight years, uh, I didn't have the safety of the job that I left in New York. It's a different, different uh, unions and all sorts of uh, complications to do the same thing in LA, but that's not what I was going to LA for. So I had to do all these other jobs, side jobs. I drove rideshare, I, I uh, worked in catering, all these things that I'd never done before and gotten to the point where I was broke, I was out of money, I was out of food, I was out of even government assistance for food. Mm. and. The only thing I hadn't done at that point was the thing that was left to do, which was to get on my knees and surrender my entire life and my career and everything that I had up to that point over to God because there wasn't anything I realized I could do on my own. It really wasn't until after that moment, um, it was about almost six years ago now, where I just said, Jesus, I surrender myself to you, take care of everything, and that day, I received this incomprehensible financial miracle that changed my life. And then three months later, I booked The Chosen.